Welcome to Whispers of the Guilty. Today we delve into a chilling tale from Mount Vernon, New Hampshire, where the serene life of Kimberly Cates was brutally cut short on October 4th, 2009. This episode unravels the harrowing events that transformed a quiet town into a scene of unimaginable violence, exposing the dark impulses of four teenagers. Join me as we explore the depths of this tragic story, the relentless pursuit of justice, and the resilience of a community forever changed by this horrific crime. The morning of October 4, 2009, dawned with an eerie stillness in Mount Vernon, New Hampshire, a quaint town nestled among rolling hills and dense woods. The serenity of this New England village would soon be shattered by a brutal and senseless crime that forever changed the lives of its residents. Kimberly Cates, a beloved wife, mother, and nurse, became the tragic center of this story. Her life brutally ended in an act of unimaginable violence. Kimberly Cates, 42 years old, was known for her warm smile and kind heart. She lived with her husband, David, and their 11-year-old daughter, Jamie, in a cozy home on Trow Road. The Cates family embodied the quintessential American dream, their lives filled with simple joys and strong community ties. Kimberly's gentle nature and dedication to her family and profession made her a cherished figure in Mount Vernon. David Cates worked as a project manager, often traveling for work. On the night of October 3, 2009, he was away on a business trip, leaving Kimberly and Jamie alone in their home. The house, nestled in a secluded area, provided a sense of security and peace that now seems tragically ironic. Surrounded by trees and far from the nearest neighbor, the Cates residence would become the scene of a horrific crime that no one could have foreseen. That same night, a group of teenagers, driven by a deadly mix of boredom and a desire for thrills, set their sights on the Cates home. Stephen Spader, Christopher Gribble, Quinn Glover, and William Marks were typical high school students in appearance, but beneath the surface lurked dark impulses. Spader, 17, and Gribble, 19, were the ringleaders, their fascination with violence and death steering the group towards their gruesome mission. Stephen Spader was a charismatic yet deeply troubled teenager. Despite his outward charm, he harbored violent fantasies and a disturbing fascination with murder. Christopher Gribble, Spader's close friend, shared these dark interests. Gribble's outward demeanor was unassuming, but his mind was a cauldron of suppressed rage and sociopathic tendencies. Glover and Marx were less enthusiastic but went along, caught in the sway of their more dominant friends. On the evening of October 3rd, the four teenagers gathered at Spader's house, their conversations laced with sinister intent. Armed with knives and a machete, they planned a break-in with the express purpose of committing murder. Their choice of the Kate's home seemed almost random, a chilling reminder of how fragile and arbitrary life can be. As the group approached the Kate's house in the early hours of October 4th, a sense of dread hung in the air. They cut the phone lines and entered the home through a back door, the quiet of the night amplifying the sound of their footsteps. Kimberly and Jamie were asleep, blissfully unaware of the horror about to unfold. Inside the house, the intruders moved with calculated precision. They first entered Kimberly and David's bedroom, where Kimberly lay sleeping. Without hesitation, Spader and Gribble launched their brutal attack. Kimberly awoke to a nightmare, assaulted by a barrage of machete strikes. The brutality of the attack was staggering, the ferocity of each blow driven by a terrifying blend of hatred and detachment. Kimberly's screams echoed through the house, jolting Jamie awake. The young girl, terrified and confused, witnessed the horror from her bedroom doorway. Spader and Gribble turned their attention to her, but a miraculous stroke of fate intervened. Despite their intent to leave no witnesses, they hesitated, perhaps unnerved by the sheer cruelty of their actions. They struck Jamie multiple times, leaving her for dead, and fled the scene. In the aftermath of the attack, the house was a scene of chaos and bloodshed. Kimberly lay lifeless, her body bearing the horrific marks of the assault. Miraculously, Jamie survived, her injuries severe, but not fatal. She managed to crawl to a phone and dial 911, her voice weak but determined as she relayed the unimaginable events. The arrival of the authorities marked the beginning of a painstaking investigation, the brutality of the crime sent shockwaves through the community, and the task of unraveling the horror fell to the detectives and forensic teams. The evidence collected from the scene, combined with Jamie's harrowing account, pointed unmistakably to Spader and his accomplices. 
As news of the crime spread, the town of Mont Vernon grappled with a collective sense of grief and disbelief. The Cates family, once the epitome of normalcy, was now at the center of a nightmarish tragedy. Kimberly's death left a void that could never be filled, her life cruelly taken in an act of senseless violence. The investigation into Kimberly Cates murder began with grim determination. The brutality of the crime demanded swift and decisive action. Detective Michael Carignan, a seasoned investigator with the New Hampshire State Police, led the charge. He assembled a team of detectives, forensic experts, and local officers, each member resolute in their pursuit of justice for Kimberly and Jamie. As Jamie Cates lay in her hospital bed, her survival was nothing short of miraculous. Despite her severe injuries, she demonstrated remarkable resilience and courage. Jamie's detailed description of the attackers provided the first critical leads. Her account, filled with the vivid horror of that night, painted a picture of a senseless and brutal attack. The descriptions of the assailants, teenage boys with a frightening detachment, were both chilling and invaluable. Detective Carignan and his team began to piece together the events leading up to the crime. They scoured the area for any clues, interviewing neighbors and examining security footage from nearby homes. The secluded location of the Cates residence made the task challenging, but the detectives were undeterred. They knew that somewhere in the small town of Mont Vernon, the perpetrators were hiding. The breakthrough came from an unexpected source, a tip from a concerned parent. The parent reported that their son, Quinn Glover, had come home with blood on his clothes and was acting strangely. This tip led the investigators to Glover, who, under intense questioning, began to crack. Glover's confession was a tangled web of fear and guilt, revealing the names of his accomplices, Stephen Spader, Christopher Gribble, and William Marks. Spader and Gribble were arrested swiftly, their reactions starkly different. Spader, the self-appointed leader of the group, displayed a chilling nonchalance. He seemed almost proud of his actions, his demeanor devoid of remorse. Gribble, on the other hand, attempted to rationalize the crime, painting himself as a victim of circumstance and influence. Marx, the most reluctant participant, appeared haunted by his involvement, his conscience gnawed by the gravity of their actions. The evidence against the group was damning. The bloodstains on their clothes, the weapons used in the attack, and the detailed confessions created an airtight case. Spader's laptop provided further incriminating evidence, revealing a disturbing fascination with violence and a premeditated plan to kill. The detectives uncovered messages exchanged between the boys, filled with fantasies and chilling indifference to human life. The town of Mont Vernon watched in horror as the details of the crime emerged. The community, once defined by its tranquility, was now grappling with a profound sense of loss and betrayal. The Cates family had been a pillar of the community, and Kimberly's death cast a long shadow over the town. Vigils and memorials were held in her honor, and the community rallied around David and Jamie, offering their support and condolences. As the investigation progressed, the legal proceedings began to take shape. The case was a media sensation, drawing national attention. The brutality of the crime and the ages of the perpetrators created a perfect storm of public outrage and fascination. Prosecutors prepared to bring the full weight of the law against Spader and his accomplices, determined to secure justice for Kimberly Cates. The trials were set to be a spectacle, with every detail scrutinized by the public and the media. Spader, the ringleader, faced charges of first-degree murder, attempted murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and burglary. Gribble, Glover, and Marx faced similar charges, their roles in the crime meticulously laid out by the prosecution. In the courtroom, the atmosphere was charged with tension. Family members, friends, and townsfolk filled the seats, their faces etched with grief and anger. David Cates, now a widower and the father of a recovering daughter, sat stoically, his presence a testament to his strength and resilience. Jamie, still recovering from her injuries, became the emotional heart of the proceedings. Her bravery in recounting the events of that night moved everyone in the courtroom. The prosecution, led by Assistant Attorney General Jeffrey Strelzen, presented a compelling case. They detailed the premeditation, the brutality of the attack, and the callousness of the perpetrators. Spader's own words, captured in his messages and journal entries, painted a damning portrait of a young man driven by dark and violent fantasies. The defense teams faced an uphill battle. 
Spader's lawyer attempted to argue that his client was influenced by a troubled upbringing and a dysfunctional family life. Gribble's defense centered on claims of mental illness and a lack of understanding of his actions. Glover and Marx, who had shown more remorse, sought to distance themselves from the planning and execution of the crime, portraying themselves as unwilling participants. Throughout the trial, the prosecution methodically dismantled these defenses. The forensic evidence, combined with the chilling confessions, left little room for doubt. Jamie's testimony was a powerful moment, her courage and clarity in describing the attack reinforcing the horror of the crime and the need for justice. As the trial drew to a close, the jury deliberated on the fate of the accused. The weight of the evidence and the sheer brutality of the crime left little doubt in the minds of the jurors. Stephen Spader was found guilty on all counts, his sentencing reflecting the severity of his actions. He received life in prison without the possibility of parole, a sentence that ensured he would never again walk free. Christopher Gribble, too, was found guilty and received a similar sentence. Glover and Marx, whose involvement was deemed less direct, received lengthy prison sentences, their futures irrevocably altered by their participation in the crime. The verdicts brought a measure of closure to the Cates family and the community, but the scars of that night would linger for years to come. In the aftermath of the trial, Mont Vernon began the slow process of healing. The community's resilience and solidarity were tested but ultimately strengthened. Kimberly Cates's memory lived on in the hearts of those who knew her, her life a testament to kindness and compassion. The crime that took her life was a stark reminder of the darkness that can lurk beneath the surface, but it also highlighted the enduring strength of a community united in the face of tragedy. David and Jamie Cates, despite their profound loss, continued to find ways to honor Kimberly's memory. Their journey of healing was a long and difficult one, but they drew strength from each other and the support of their community. The story of Kimberly Cates, though marked by unspeakable horror, also became a story of resilience, courage, and the unbreakable bonds of love and family. As the courtroom doors closed behind the convicted, the residents of Mont Vernon were left to grapple with the aftermath of Kimberly Cates's brutal murder. The trial had concluded, but the echoes of that night continued to resonate through the small town. For David and Jamie Cates, life was irrevocably changed. They faced the daunting task of rebuilding their lives while coping with an unimaginable loss. David Cates, now a widower, was determined to create a sense of normalcy for Jamie. He focused on his daughter's recovery, both physical and emotional. Jamie's survival was a testament to her strength, but the road ahead was long and fraught with challenges. The scars she bore were not only physical, but also emotional a constant reminder of the trauma she endured. Jamie returned to school, where she was met with a mix of support and curiosity. Her classmates, aware of the tragedy, extended their kindness, but the weight of her experience set her apart. Teachers and counselors provided additional support, helping her navigate the complexities of adolescence while dealing with her trauma. David, too, found solace in the routines of daily life, though the absence of Kimberly was a void that could never be filled. In the wider community, the crime had left an indelible mark. Mont Vernon, once a haven of tranquility, now carried the burden of this horrific event. The town's residents banded together, organizing vigils and fundraisers in Kimberly's memory. These acts of solidarity offered comfort and a sense of purpose, helping to mend the fabric of their community. Amidst the efforts to heal, the town also faced the need for increased security. The realization that such a brutal crime could occur in their midst led to heightened vigilance. Neighborhood watch programs were established, and local law enforcement increased their presence. While these measures brought a degree of reassurance, they also served as a reminder of the vulnerability that had been exposed. The legal repercussions of the crime continued to unfold as appeals and motions were filed. Stephen Spader and Christopher Gribble, both sentenced to life without parole, sought to overturn their convictions. Their appeals, however, were met with staunch opposition from the prosecution, who argued that the severity of their crimes warranted the harshest penalties. For David and Jamie, the legal battles were a painful reminder of the past. Each court appearance, each motion filed, dredged up the horrors of that night. Yet they faced these challenges with resilience, determined to see justice upheld. The support from their community and the broader public played a crucial role in maintaining their strength. In the years following the trial, David and Jamie made strides in their personal healing.
David found solace in his work and in the support of friends and family. Jamie, despite the trauma, began to reclaim her childhood. She participated in extracurricular activities, made new friends, and slowly started to rebuild her sense of normalcy. The memory of her mother remained a guiding light, inspiring her to live a life that honored Kimberly's legacy. The story of Kimberly Cates also sparked a broader conversation about youth violence and the factors that contribute to such heinous acts. Community leaders, educators, and law enforcement officials collaborated to address these issues, aiming to prevent similar tragedies. Programs focused on mental health, conflict resolution, and community engagement were introduced, fostering an environment of support and awareness. Amid these efforts, the memory of Kimberly Cates remained a powerful symbol of kindness and compassion. Scholarships were established in her name, benefiting students who exemplified her values of empathy and dedication. These initiatives ensured that Kimberly's legacy would continue to impact lives positively, even in her absence. As the years passed, Mont Vernon slowly began to heal. The town's resilience and solidarity in the face of tragedy became a source of inspiration. The horrific crime that took Kimberly's life could not erase the love and kindness she had brought into the world. Instead, it highlighted the strength of a community united by shared grief and a commitment to honoring her memory. David and Jamie's journey, marked by profound loss and remarkable courage, became a testament to the enduring power of love and resilience. Their story, intertwined with the community's efforts to heal and prevent future violence, underscored the importance of unity and compassion in overcoming the darkest of times. Kimberly Kate's legacy lived on, not just in the scholarships and memorials, but in the hearts of those who knew her and the many who were touched by her story. Her life, though tragically cut short, became a beacon of hope and a reminder of the profound impact one person can have on the world. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the heart of darkness that befell Mont Vernon. The tragic loss of Kimberly Cates and the brutal attack on her daughter Jamie serve as a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the hidden dangers that can lurk within seemingly ordinary lives. As we conclude this episode, let us remember Kimberly's legacy of kindness and compassion and the strength and resilience of those who survive such unspeakable tragedies. Stay tuned for more stories that uncover the shadows and bring light to the most haunting tales. Until next time, this is Silence, signing off from Whispers of the Guilty.